Welcome to the Original Gangsters podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bernstein. This is one of uh, my most highly anticipated uh, episodes that I've done in my time um, podcasting as well as on YouTube these last two years. I've been trying to lock this this down for about uh, three, four years now, and I'm very, very excited to introduce uh, a man that in certain parts of this country need no, needs no introduction, but for other parts m- might not know him. Uh, his name is Eddie Cox, and he was a quite a notorious um, underworld figure in Kansas City, uh, 60s, 70s, maybe in the 50s, uh, 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, went to prison for about 30 years and uh, came out and now is doing um, great work with Tom uh, Norad in his uh, law office uh, out of Springfield, Missouri, and his uh, his 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 partner in, in a lot of this good work, uh, Rusty Marks, who also did uh, a significant amount of time, and they're going to come on and tell their story. But I just want to, before I hand it over to them and uh, let them talk about what they're doing and have Eddie kind of tell a little bit of his um, his life story. Eddie Cox is somebody that you you might you might know him and not even know you know him because there was a movie a very famous movie that uh according to hollywood lore uh he helped inspire it was the movie called king of new york and even though eddie is from kansas city uh the the people that put that movie together uh in the early 90s had heard about eddie's story and kind of got inspired eddie was for lack of a better term, uh, a leader in the Kansas City Black Mafia, even though he's a white guy, and uh, did a lot of work with the Italians and and other people. And uh, and now, like I said, this is like, this is one of the best reclamation, rehabilitation stories you will ever hear because Eddie, uh, when he was in prison, was doing a lot of uh, jailhouse lawyering, helping people get out. He's got a brilliant mind. And now he's uh, a paralegal for Tom and they're really they're doing amazing work. Thank you for joining us, guy. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you for joining us, guys. Sorry that was a long ramble. So that it's Tom on your left, Eddie in the middle, and then Rusty on the right. Um, well, let, let, I don't want to bury a lead here. They just got another. Uh, it, just in the last uh, week, they got a, a, a somebody out on a compassionate release that uh, plays into some of this narrative mark sorrentino who was a kansas city italian mob figure uh, got out on a compassionate because he's dealing with some cancer issues only had a couple years left that was this week um eddie just how does it feel to kind of be on the other side of this now you're out of prison you're you're in a, a legal office you're 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 making a living you know totally legitimately and doing really positive work given back to the community how, how, how do you feel about it 80, he's 89 years old by the way guys 89 89 feel great you realize that we've made a 180 degree turn here from being a criminal to now to trying to help someone and uh did you start a very did, good feeling did you know anything or were you somebody that uh, when he went when he went away to prison, would you would you go away in eighty nine? Eighty nine, yes. Did you went released away in, in two thousand one to two thousand twenty one? Twenty one, yes. Yeah. Did you know? Were you somebody that was very familiar with the intricacies of the law when you when you got to prison in in eighty nine, or was it something you learned while you were locked up? I was already. In fact, I was working at a law office at the time that I went in. Uh, Prison in 89. So when did you get, a? you know, so, so again, just for people to know, within the federal prison system, Eddie was known as a, like, Clarence Darrow-like uh, figure behind, or a, a Johnny Cochran, or a, whatever famous attorney. He, he was somebody that had a reputation from coast to coast as somebody that you could bring your case to, and he could help you. Uh, navigate the legal system and and, and find ways to uh, try to propel yourself out of incarceration. When did you start learning the legal system, Eddie? In the late 50s. Okay, tell us about that. (laughs) In the late 50s, I started uh, studying the law in the late 50s. And it 
never stopped the continuation of the education. In fact, I taught Rusty. Rusty came to Leavenworth in the early 1990s, and he was wanted to fight his own case. So I put him to work up in the law library with me, and I tried to teach him everything that I knew, and ended up, he ended up with a great knowledge of the law. In fact, he's very knowledgeable today. I, I can tell, and, and we're definitely going to get to to Rusty in this interview, and we're going to have him tell his story, um, and then have Tom kind of talk a little bit about the uh, behind the scenes stuff at the law firm. But let's just start off a little bit more, give you give people a little bit more of an insight into your career um, as a criminal. Like, did you, in the 50s, were you interacting with the, the Sevilla guys in the 50s or wasn't it until, was it in, in the 60s you met those guys? In the early 60s, I started to interact with in the early 60s. How did you get hooked up with them? Because I was in the narcotic business. Even back then? Yes, and in the early sixties. At I that point, use. we were working with. Uh, he had it for again for people that don't know. He had kind of a, a couple guys in the. They didn't really have an official name, but you know, for lack of a better term, Kansas City Black Mafia, uh, Doc Dearborn, and um, uh, 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 Eugene, Eugene Richardson. Eugene Richardson. When, when did you meet the those other individuals? Richardson. Doc Dearborn and Richardson. Right. Jane. When did you meet them? In the early 60s. And 61, 60, 61. And were they doing business with the uh, Sevillas and the Italians at that point? No, no. How did uh, that work? How did you how did you bridge that gap and, and get everyone together to kind of work together? Because they would talk to me and they would not talk to the blacks. And how did you meet them? How did you meet the Sevilla guys? I I had a formal introduction. Can you tell us who introduced you, or you don't want to say that? No, no. Not that. <laughs> okay, no. sorry. And uh, so in the 60s, this was really at the peak of the Italian mafia's power, not just in Kansas City, but in um, around the country. Uh, Nick Sevilla was was the, the godfather of, of Kansas City for 30 plus years. Uh, his brother, his nephew, all were involved and uh, they were heavily involved in Las Vegas. Did you, did, you, did you get to go to Vegas a lot? Yes, back in the day, back in the 60s, yes. <laughs> and uh, just talk about the, you know, just the atmosphere of the underworld at that point where there was kind of more, I mean, I, more romanticism. There was a little bit less attention. I think the federal government wasn't going after them as much as they did uh, after J uh, uh, Hoover died. What was it like in the 60s? Well, we didn't have to worry about Hoover back then. He said there was no organized crime. Right. So, so was it like, did it feel like difference. it was an open season? More or less. But at that time, the, the FBI, you really didn't have to worry about the FBI. Right. Like if you were in the drug business, there was no DEA. The DEA didn't become active until 1973. Right. Prior in the late 60s, you had the BNDD, which was Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs. They're the people who investigated. So were you dealing with the Kansas City Police Department? Yeah, you didn't worry about the Kansas City Police Department. We they they no were problem. easily. We had no problem with Kansas City, Missouri Police Department. So for a while there, when you were getting started, it seems like you, you kind of had free reign to stretch your legs, uh, if, for lack of a better term, in, in uh, your business. As long as you operated on the east side in Kansas City, which was they called the ghetto, which was all the black area. It wasn't even police all that heavily. And nobody really cared. You know, back in the day. Was was there a black organized crime? In, I mean, I, I can just speak from, you know, I'm from Detroit. And in Detroit, there was kind of black organized crime before uh, World War II. And then after World War II, you had a lot of kind of independent stuff. 
And then kind of like, I think with your case, the Italians started to find their way into business partnerships and whatnot in the fifties and sixties. Was there a, a group of black racketeers that preceded Doc Dearborn and, and those guys? Not in Kansas City, no. There was nothing organized in the black area in the black community at that time. What was Doc Dearborn like? Doc was a, a, a gentleman, but he was a dangerous gentleman. Do you, um, I'm kind of going to be all over the place on this, but, uh, and if you don't feel comfortable uh, answering, I, I, I get it. Doc Dearborn uh, was, was killed in 1985. At that point, there was a transition in leadership uh, in the Kansas City, Kansas City Organized Crime Group. There were a number of homicides that either were or could have been tied to that. I know that Doc Dearborn was killed uh, at, at a hotel uh, by the airport. A kind motel. of a deal gone wrong. Do you think it had anything to do with that transfer of power? No, none. What happened was the DEA set him up with two of their informants. Their informants tried to rob Doc and end up killing him. So nothing Both more than that. DEA that informants. But it had nothing to do with Willie Camisano. No, 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 no. He had nothing to do with the changeover in Kansas City to time. Yeah. Did you did you get along with both uh, from when the Sevillas kind of phased out? And Willie the Rat came in. Were you copacetic with the new group? I had no dealings with the new group at all. Oh, so you're saying by the mid '80s you were kind of on your own? I was in the yes, we were basically on our own at that time. Okay, and you were? Did you kind of tell us the trajectory of your? Because basically the organization had been broke up there in Kansas City it was fractional and uh no we we had no interaction at all what what was the um trajectory of your narcotics trafficking did you start with marijuana and then go to uh more powder substances or was it always no, we started we started with heroin back started in the day that was all heroin okay cocaine uh you couldn't even give it away back at that in the point day. Did you start to get into that world, though, by the 70s and 80s when it became more uh, available and, and uh, desired? No, because I was in prison in the 70s. I, I was convicted in 1970. Okay, I apologize. So I, I Okay, so you, you were in from 70 to when? I was in from 70 until November of 80. And then I got a new trial. And I was didn't get convicted until eighty two. Then I got a new trial in eighty eight and was convicted in eighty nine. Then in so eighty nine, huh? Were you yes, out? Yes, I was out each time. Yes, I was out on bond. Yes. So you were pretty much out. So you were out from like eighty to eighty nine. Yes, eighty eight okay. to eighty nine. Yeah. But what about eighty? What about nineteen eighty? Eighty to eighty two. I was out on bond for a couple of years. Yes. Okay, I got it. And uh, can you talk a little bit about how the drug business changed in your, you know, decades uh, involved in it? Well, actually, in the 80s, they started going to cocaine. And then later on, they were uh, then meth methamphetamine started in the late 80s. You know, we never had anything to do with methamphetamine or the uh Coke, we didn't operate it. Although Doc had got in the cocaine business. He was in the Coke business in the 80s. That's how, when he got killed, Doc was in the. Could you see though, when you came out of, when you came out of, when you came out of prison, out of prison, you'd been in for 10 years. And the, the, I'm guessing that the landscape in the drug business between 1970 and 1980 had changed a lot, right? Completely changed, yes. Can you talk about what you encountered when you when you did come out? Well, I didn't get back in the drug business then. Although when I got out in 88 and 89, I started robbing major drug dealers. 
like just using... stick up stuff or stuff where you would intercept uh, shipments. No, I was uh, I was doing Colombians basically robbing Colombians, but I was doing it with DEA credentials. Okay. So you'd pretend like it was a bus? That, huh? You'd pretend using like it was badge. a bus? Yes. And I had had a drug dog. Okay. There's a badge in the car? In the badge, huh? There's a badge in the truck? Yeah. Like yeah, no, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> yeah. What are your, uh, and then we're going to we're gonna um, move on to uh, Rusty in a second and talk about how, you, and I want Rusty to tell the story of how he got locked up and then how he met uh, Eddie. But uh, Eddie, just uh, talk just a little bit about the Sevillas. And you had, a, did you have a lot of interaction with Nick and, and Cork? I was friendly with them, yes. What were they like? What kind of people were they? They were gentlemen, both of them. Both Cork and Nick, both, both perfect gentlemen. Did you have any opportunity to, to meet other Italian La Cosa Nostra figures from other cities? Over the years, yes. Uh, from your work on the street or from when you were locked up? When I was locked up as okay, well. So as was... on the, yes, yes, on the, when I was but locked what, up as well. But when you were on the oh. street in the 70s or, or sorry, in the 60s, were you doing business outside of just the Sevillas? Were you working with St. Louis or New York or Chicago? Chicago. Yes. Um, was, was Chicago a group that always the Italians in Chicago, did they have, was there, even though they were however many miles away, did it always seem like Chicago had some, I don't want to necessarily say oversight, but some presence in Kansas city, Yes. All the stuff in Vegas and stuff. Yes. What was it? What was Vegas like back in the sixties? What was that? Wide open. What was it like going there for? You know, just to you know entertain yourself for a couple days. I mean, it must have been. You know, you had you could go see any amount of iconic acts at the uh, the hotels, but I'm sure it was a different experience than you than you than you have now when you go there. They had all the great shows back though. You know, all of the entertainers entertained in Vegas back then. If they were anybody, they were in Vegas. And all the shows were great. But anything you wanted was available in Vegas. Vegas was basically a wide open city. Yeah. And all the families operated out there. Right. It was an open city. Uh so Rusty, tell us a little bit about um your backstory. Um, my backstory is um, I basically grew up in an all Hispanic neighborhood. Um, when we got to be about 14 years old and they were selling um, marijuana and stuff in the neighborhood, um, they basically said that I needed to go see the white guys and sell them the marijuana. When I asked them, well, why would I do that? And they said, because you're white. I said, well, why don't y'all go do that? And they said, well, we don't trust them. So I was like, so I began as the intermediary between the Hispanic neighborhood and the white neighborhood. And, and I made a lot of money being that intermediary. I mean, all the way back into high school. And so I was a semi-pro skateboarder and there was a BMW dealership right beside the skateboard park. And come to find out that but this was prior to Scarface. Um, the Colombians actually owned the BMW dealership that backed up to the skateboard park. And I met the Colombians at the freaking skateboard park. And then, so my, my roommate at the time um, was going to school at the university of Houston and was a chemist. And so when the Colombians realized that we could do melt tests and stuff on the, on the cocaine that was coming in from Colombia, then we were we were plugged in we were, we were plugged in good because um, when the stuff came in they wanted to know what it was and we had access to the lab and at the University of Houston and could test it. Was that was this when there was the boom? Was this in the mid eighties? Yeah, this was in the early eighties before the when the boom was just getting when the I want to say eighty one when the boom was just 
coming on. I mean, we were like in from the start. And um, so you couldn't you couldn't beat our prices. You couldn't beat our quality. You just couldn't beat it. And so and um, I had a fantastic time. Did, did you have any interactions with the Sevilla crime family at all? No, sir. Not till I got to Leavenworth. Well, I, I don't know that the Savelle is in Leavenworth. <laughs> did you know who Eddie Cox was when you were on the street? No, sir, I did not. Not on not on the streets. I did not meet him until I got to Leavenworth. But I'm saying, did you know of him? Did you had you no, heard sir. of him? No, sir. I I I lived in Springfield, Missouri, and I sold cocaine in Kansas City, Missouri, and and Springfield, Missouri. Um, but your generations yeah. you probably didn't cross over. That's why you wouldn't have known him, right? Why? Right. So talk about meeting him when you got to uh, Leavenworth. Um, the DEA basically seized my house, my business. They took all my money. What what the DEA didn't get, friends and family members got. Um, so when I got to Leavenworth, I was completely broke. They just gave me a life sentence. And um, so um, they had a three strikes law. And I was one of the very first people sentenced to a mandatory life term with no release in 1990. And so I go to jail and I get to, Le I, I get to Leavenworth and, and I have to I, I, I go into federal prison with the 10th grade education and no money. And so I got to learn this. I have to learn this. And Eddie Cox, Eddie Cox was the, was the guy. And so I went to go meet Eddie and I told Eddie, I have to, I have to have, I have to learn this. I have to, I have to have a job. I have to, I have to learn this. Um, and, and I actually wrote a story about this in college about our, our introduction and Eddie said, okay, enough, stop, stop. Just okay, you you just show we work, we work seven days a week, week, we work 10 hours a day, and this is and this is what we do. Um, and I will thank Eddie uh, because because of Eddie, I never became a gang member. Okay, and so from Eddie's perspective, which was which come which turns out to be correct, why would you become a gang member in federal prison when you can become a, a legal person and deal with all of them. Did, Why would you commit yourself to one crew when you can be the premier legal person in the institution and deal with all of them? You can be valuable to everybody. Oh yeah. We're valuable to everybody. Um, it, it, did it help the fact that you came from Missouri? Like if you had come from California, would it have been maybe different? Eddie, Eddie, what do you, the fact that he was from your home state, uh, make you a little bit more willing to take them under your wing? Well, the fact that he wanted, he, he was seeking knowledge and he wanted to help himself. This was the main thing. He, he's driving himself to help himself. And so you guys, were you guys in the same um, facility together for how long? Like 10 years. We were in the same unit, even. We lived in the same unit. What was uh, Rusty, without uh, um, getting, you know, too, uh, I mean, we, we, we don't want to say things that, 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 that people might um, look at as being out of school or anything, but was Eddie somebody that, you know, people knew this guy was somebody that had a real sharp brain on him and also had the bona fides of, of uh, you know, who he, who he was dealing with back before he got locked up? Um, so 30 years ago, Eddie was not 89, okay? He was yeah. 59. And he was very abusive. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sharp-tongued. He, he was a very abusive character, okay? <laughs> but one of the things at, at Leavenworth is that all of the staff members, all of the staff members, so – if you look at the if you look at the Department of Justice hierarchy, a Bureau of Prisons employee is like on, way down on the ladder. I, maybe a park ranger might be something less, but they all aspire to be like a uh, a um, an FBI agent or or want to work for customs or something. And so they would come to Eddie to help them prepare their their job resumes. Okay, to come, they came to Eddie with divorces. Uh, they came to Eddie with. Um, with DWIs, um, and so not only did we have a lot of inmate traffic, at, so we worked in the we worked in the education department, and um, 
I made a mistake in the education part. When I got there, the, the, the office where Eddie worked was an absolute disaster. Okay, and, and so I, I, I cleaned it up. Like, I mean, why wouldn't you clean up the office so you could have a nice, neat, tidy office? And Eddie said, you, we, we have made a terrible error. And the uh, new assistant warden walked through there, and he said, how, how is it that these two guys are in this nice, neat, clean office, and my staff members are over here, and their offices are all messed up? And so they made a switch. They made a switch <laughs> offices with the staff members. I mean, the only difference was that the trash was picked up and the floor was vacuumed. It's like, but they made us. They made a switch. Anyways, I learned a lesson there that that they do not do not outshine the prison staff. That's a terrible idea. Tom, Tom, how did you meet these guys? Well, I, I met. Rusty, uh, first of all, I had heard of Eddie before I met Rusty, but but uh, you know, Rusty was on supervised release. He'd been out for a couple of years. He'd worked for a, for an attorney up in, in uh, Indiana for a while, and uh, he was looking for an attorney local here to work with. He had worked briefly for for another guy, and um, you know, I was a correctional officer briefly before I was an attorney. Before I went to law school, and I don't know. I think. Uh, I could tell right off the bat he had a good head on his shoulders, and uh, I, I wanted to work for that guy and give him a shot. And so you've had both these guys with you for three years now. Yeah, about that, two, three years. We've been working together. And uh, how many, uh, how many guys have you, or or people, not necessarily guys, but how many inmates have you guys helped uh, just in this, in just in these three years? In the last, in the last three years. We have had 16 life sentences reduced to time served. Okay, so I don't know how many of the of the small ones. Um, so, so you can't see it here, but like up like up at my house, um, I have all the pictures on the wall. If you you don't make the wall unless you have a life sentence, you have to have a life sentence, and we get it reduced to time served. You get your picture on the wall. <laughs> Oh, that must be uh, talk talk about it from your perspective, uh, Rusty. I can't imagine being told when I was whatever, however you were old you were, 25 or 30 or being told like, hey, this is it. You're done. You're, you're never going to see the light of day again. And then being able to, over the years, learn the system enough where you can find a way to have a light at the tunnel, light at the end of the tunnel. Like talk about that, like the spectrum of emotions from going there realizing or thinking in yourself thinking in your head that this this is the place I'll be for the rest of my life to then being able to matriculate yourself out of there via your brain I'm going to say that, that one of the things that I did and I and and I when I was in Leavenworth with Eddie we walked around the track and so after I got to the other institutions I had sort of kind of convinced myself that if I get up every morning and I go out and I go out to the rec yard and I walk around the track there has to be a number of laps that I will make before I go home. So every day I whittled, <laughs> whittled away at this number. It's like that was like my, my thing. I knew that there had to be a number of laps that I would walk around the, the track and then magically I would come home. And so that essentially was my, was I don't know, so I did it every day. I did it, I did it every day to reduce that number. And I did 30 years. And then one day that that magical number like appeared. But he also obtained an education while he was in there. He obtained a couple college degrees, which is commendable. Yeah, incredibly commendable. Eddie, when you went in there in 1989, did you think there was a chance that you would never come out? I always thought there was a chance because I was always going to fight them. I was going to stay in court. Yes. You do you feel like your reputation on the street hurt you in terms of – do you think if you hadn't have been the, the Eddie Cox that everybody knew in the Kansas City underworld, do you think you would have maybe done 20 years instead of the 32? Probably or less, yes. Well, what, 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 how, how do you reconcile that now just uh, as a human being knowing that at one point in time you were viewed by people as a – I guess, a, for lack of a better term, a, a, a danger to society or someone that shouldn't be allowed to live a normal life. And then now 
in your final chapter, you're you're proving everyone wrong and you're you're really contributing to a society that wanted no part of you for a period of time. But we have a goal. We want to get people out of prison. There are, there are just hundreds and hundreds of people that should not be in federal prison that have been wrongly convicted and have done 20 and 30 years without any help at all. But do you, what I'm saying, do you as a, as a person, do you ever look back on your, your younger self and be like, wow, I'm a, I've really done a 180 here to, to, to who I was when I was 40 or 50 or 30 or. Yes. Is it, is it something that you take pride in? And then Rusty will come in and. Because I tolerate people now. <laughs> That's a great answer. That's a great answer. Rusty, go ahead. Okay, so we work for a really good for a really good guy. Okay. And so one so Tom Nord really didn't tell you anything about himself. So one of the things that Tom Nord did early in his career is he won several jury trials for a million dollar verdicts in, in federal court in Kansas City. Um and so and one of the things that he does really, really well is he is he he cross examines. He's okay. When you go into, a, so I've worked for a couple of attorneys and I, and I have been, and I've gone to a lot, I've been to lots and lots of court hearings. As have I, I've covered lots of okay. trials. I actually have a lot of time. I actually have a law degree. I, uh, <laughs> the, um, the, uh, the one thing, the one thing that you look for in an attorney and, and so many people don't get it is the, is the, com, is the command presence, a person that goes into court and, and his presence in the court, Okay, allows him to to get get a point his view or get a point his argument, and, and Tom does that that really well. So, okay, I'm going to shift gears and go back to to the Eddie on on the people that we help. Right now in the United States, there are over two hundred thousand people serving life sentences. Okay, so I think that we could we will agree that the majority of them probably need to be there to pr protect society, but there is a percentage that do not. They do not need to be there. And if that percentage is one, then there are 2,000 people in the United States that do not need to be in prison. Okay. Those are the people that we're after. Okay. And if we could, if we could get 2,000 people out of prison before we, before we pass or here at Tom Nord Law, okay, then that, 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 that's a legacy. That's, that's, that's what I'm after. I'm after that 2,000. If I could get 2,000, I'd be very happy. And so right now we've gotten 15 in three years. And so those numbers are insufficient. We need to get way more people out of jail. Tom, what's your, I mean, I know this is, this is kind of a, a big question. Maybe you can just answer it in a smaller way. I know we could probably ask this, ask this question and then talk about it for, for days, but just in terms of the state of our justice system and how we incarcerate and how we, um, go about facilitating punishment and and rehabilitation. With where where do you think where where are the the where, where are the biggest places that you as a defense attorney see flaws that that need to be corrected? Well, you know, I I think with the First Step Act and things that have been passed recent in the recent past, you know hitting it from the backside like we do people who have served time you know to reevaluate that I, I think that needs to be expanded um you know and I, we, we're talking here in federal court a lot i'm in federal and state court you know and we've got some legislation in the state of missouri trying to kind of make a compassionate release type law for the state of missouri as well um you know, it's, it's, it's tough. Uh, you know, we've had some big changes in the law around here. You know, marijuana laws have kind of gone under. We've got some big changes to federal laws and guns that are, that are looking at that, that could have some big influences in some of these things. But, you know, the main thing that I think, and you'll know this going to law school, uh, this situation that we have here that we've been working over for three, three years. Uh, tell me if this is the truth with you. About a third of the people I went to law school with were just really hard workers. Okay. Mm -hmm. They may not be the sharpest knife in the drawer, but they were really hard work and they made through it. And you got about a third of them who are wickedly smart. So smart that, you know, we can't even think on their level. 
but there, there's only about a third of them that have the practical knowledge and the book smart. And those are your trial leaders. What these guys possess is a whole nother level. All right. They've got, they've been put in the incubator to learn the law like no one else has ever done, but they have the practical knowledge and the street knowledge to, to use it in a, in a way that's just unheard of. That's why you see these guys in our system be so successful. And the things that these guys put these guys track records up against any lawyer in the country. You know, there's no law degree sitting next to me, but I guarantee you I'd take their record almost over anybody in the country. So I think this situation and working with the current trends in the law, it's going to be beneficial, but it's, it just still needs an overhaul. The entire First step back, I, I'm uh, a, a huge proponent of, was uh, signed into uh, legislation in uh, 2018 by the Trump administration, and it gives... Uh, non mostly nonviolent offenders. I you can you can if you are a violent offender you can still uh, benefit from the act. But mostly nonviolent offenders that are doing really lengthy prison sentences are able to use the First Step Act to get sentence reductions. And it's it's uh, I I mean I see it with my own eyes just in in the in the what six years now. Uh, it's done a lot. It's done a lot of good. Um, I, I I you know I, I feel a, a somewhat of a kinship with this. Um, with this cause, I try to do my part uh, as being a, you know, a trumpeteer in the media for incarceration and justice that needs to have a spotlight shown on it. I'm I'm very proud to say that I, I think that I help critically get two uh, two people out of prison. Um, White boy Rick, who I think has a little bit of a similarity to Eddie Cox to a degree. Um, was was the first uh, person that I, that I helped, and he was um, locked up for 33 years uh, based on a traffic stop when he was 17. They got caught uh, with some kilos of cocaine in front of his grandma's house when he was 17 years old, and some of that situation was political, involving our mayor and racial politics in Detroit. Uh, but then another person I want to ask if you knew him, if either one of you guys knew him, um, his name was Daryl Chambers. He was in Leavenworth. He was a uh, former professional boxer for, for the Cronk Gym in Detroit, which is the iconic. Um, anyway, Daryl was a um, nonviolent offender that got jammed up because the feds were intent on busting Tommy Hearns, who was our, uh, you know, kind of our favorite son here in Detroit. Uh, in terms of professional boxing, Tommy Hearns and Emmanuel Stewart, who ran Cronk Gym, uh, were really in the crosshairs of the federal government. They were in, in, intent on nailing them for drug trafficking and, con, and and conspiracy and money laundering, and they couldn't get anybody to flip on them, so they just started jamming anybody that they could. And uh, Daryl did from 93 to 22 and uh, we helped, to, you know, we, we helped uh, get him out. Unfortunately, he died of a heart attack. Oh, he had only been free for about two years. But uh, I, I feel, you know, those two cases that I just brought up that I was personally involved in. I mean, you have situations that probably should have been five, ten years max in prison. And both of those people, if it wasn't for not I'm not, I'm not going to take all the credit. If it wasn't for me and other people wanting to advocate on behalf of them, nonviolent offenses would have put them in prison forever. So, like, you know, Rusty just happened to hit that little window, mm -hmm. <laughs> that little window in time that gave him life without parole. You know, five years before, five years later, you're doing a 20 year match. So, there's people like that out there that need help. Um, um, Eddie, can, uh, can uh, you talk a little bit about, <laughs> or I guess all three of you maybe talk a little bit about the um, uh, the Ozark effect? Maybe do you guys ever you know, see the movie or the the television show? I never saw it. You haven't seen it. I was interested in what your what your uh, opinion on it. It talks a lot about Kansas City, uh, you know, quote unquote Kansas City mafia and and stuff, money laundering with the Colombians. 
uh, or the Mex sorry, the Mexicans. I thought maybe you guys would have an opinion on it. Never saw the movie. <laughs> oh, so it's, it's a it's a TV. It was a a hit Netflix television show. Oh no, I never. I just saw figured it. because it was your neck of the woods, you got. But that's neither here nor there. Um, talk about if you can. Did you know that uh, the King of New York had some kind of inspiration from your story? No, I did not. Do you know of the movie? I mean, you're aware of the movie? Yes, I'm aware of the movie, but I was also aware that that they were going to make it as well. You you knew they were making it? Huh? You're saying you knew that they were making it when they were making it? Yes, yes. How did you know? Because they contacted me. Oh, okay. So you so you so they they said we know a little bit about your story and we want to kind of pick your brain a little bit? Yeah, they wanted to do that, and uh, I gave them very little information. Did you see the movie? I've seen the movie. Yes. What do you? What's your opinion of it? It's a good movie. Do you do you feel any like? I mean, it's it's obviously it's not you. I mean, it's a fictional no. character that they then you know it's in New York. He's the king of New York, but. Do you feel like there's any of you when you watch that? Do you feel like there's that's that represents any of you? Some of the actions, yes. In terms of your ability to uh, deal uh, with you know multi ethnic groups and being accepted, I mean, the Christopher Walken character was obviously very accepted by not just you know white criminals that he was dealing with he had a he had a, a very uh multi-ethnic organization and his right hand man in the it, it was larry fishburne's character jimmy jump um yes i mean it, it definitely resonated with a lot of people um it's it's not a, it's not as well known as a goodfellas or a godfather but it definitely resonates with a certain group of people uh, that's movie. That movie is considered a cult classic. And um, from my research, I'm glad that Eddie was able to talk about how the the the, the, the people of the of the film reached out to him. But uh, from what I understood, it was kind of a they kind of took Eddie and some of what Eddie had done, and then they took another guy named Mark Ryder, who was a, a Gambino, a Jewish Gambino drug dealer with John Gotti, New who, York had a big yes. chunk of the Harlem drug racket uh, after a lot of the black kingpins had gone away. He kind of installed a, a guy named uh, uh, Applejack Jackson that, that some of his people had met in prison and they kind of took over. A lot of people don't know this. They took over. I just learned this recently. They took over what Nikki Barnes and Guy Fisher and Frank Lucas um had built in the 70s by 79, 80, 81. Mark Ryder was supplying a lot of that, took taking the place of some of the uh, Lucchese's and, and other people. Um, and that kind of, and then Abel Ferreira kind of took Mark Ryder and Eddie Cox and made them one, one uh, composite character. Yeah, go ahead, Russ. So let me kind of tell you what we're doing here uh, going forward. Yeah, so, so sorry. We'll, uh, so, we, we will uh, now segue. Go ahead. Right right now, we represent, we represent a guy named Steve Wright, okay, out of um, out of Kansas City. So Steve Wright, I want to say, had three, three homicides as a juvenile. So they took after the Supreme Court's case, and they reduced those, those three homicides to 15 years. But he kept the crack cocaine life sentence. And so under the First Step Act, we're trying to get the life sentence reduced. We want it to be to time to time served. But Steve Wright is going to be a 51st Street Crip, okay? And and so this is somebody that maybe on the, you're going to want to maybe interview on one of your future shows because he's an important figure in Kansas City. And yeah. so and so working here working here with Tom, okay? So Eddie taught me how to do legal work, and I was able, okay. I was at, when the first step came out, I was at Butner. And so it was primarily medical. And I thought, wow, this is crazy. What a great opportunity because of all the medical people on the, the guys that have been in for 30 years, 
um, with um, they were on walkers or to using oxygen, and I was getting them out left and right. And so I was able to use them to practice to do myself. <laughs> so I got out. The first person I called was Eddie. I said, I'm going to get you out. Okay. And so we were able, I had, had Eddie out within six months. And then we turned around and we got John Mandacina out. Yeah, I was about to bring okay. that up. Okay. Would you like to hear the story on? on yeah. On, so on, yeah, just for people that might not know okay, John well, Mandacina. Well, you're going to, uh, you're going to truly enjoy this story. Yeah. Kansas okay? City mob guy that, uh, Eddie and Rusty got out uh, two years ago. Give Tom Nord. Okay, watch. Okay, and and, and, you're and gonna, Tom. Oh, you're going to enjoy this story. Please tell okay? us. Okay. Okay. So Tom Nord talked to Paul Becker. Okay, Paul Becker, because because uh, John Mandacina was was going to die. He was going to die within a couple of weeks, and and so Tom was able to communicate with Paul Becker. And Paul Becker agreed to let John out of jail. Just he said, type up the order. And so because Tom, I, I, I seem to run into these abusive people, abusive, abusive. <laughs> OK, and so um, because I'm busy working all day, I just copied an order and sent it to Eddie and said, make this John's order. So Eddie takes the order and switches the the, the title and the names and gets it all changed. But. Me and Eddie did all this time in prison, and we're not used to those two slashes with the S. Okay, so on this order, it has what was the judge? Judge, whatever the judge on 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 uh, John's case, it has the the S, and then the judge's signature. So when Tom, when Eddie retypes this order and he gives it back to me, I see that S there. And I'm not positive about it. I said, but Eddie wouldn't. I mean, Eddie's been doing this forever. How can he possibly mess that up, right? So I pass it then to Tom, and Tom says, Rustin and Eddie have been doing this forever. How could they possibly mess this up? And so we sent this in. We filed this on PACER. And then so the Bureau of Prisons takes that as it is the order to release John Mandacina. Okay? And so they're communicating with the, with the judge's office, and they're like, this is not a real signature. And so then Paul Becker calls Tom and is telling Tom, Okay, I don't know who you are. I don't know what you think you're doing. But you don't sign the judge's name. You don't sign the judge's name to court orders. Okay, so Tom is then looking at me. Well, I said, Oh my gosh, yeah, I can't, I can't believe we did this. So meanwhile, the court, the court clerk is is talking to me, telling me if you will just give us a new copy of the order without the judge's signature, so he can actually sign it, he will let John go. Okay, so then when Tom sees Eddie, he says. What are you doing? And Eddie says, John Mandacine is a friend of mine. I've known him for 50 years. Okay. I will sign the judge's name to that shareholder to get my friend out. Okay. <laughs> well, that's that definitely uh that definitely is a uh, a crazy anecdote that luckily for John, you know, he he ended up walking out and uh got the care that he needed, right? And so so he goes we, so Tom and I Okay, this is very, very, very well, proud. Very, the, the judge is like ninety six years old. This is a very proud. Okay, this, this right here, this this right here sealed my deal with Tom Nord. Tom Nord and I left Springfield at about five o'clock in the morning to go get John Mandacina at Pekin, Illinois, to go pick him up from the hospital. So, in route to the hospital, the assistant warden is talking to Tom, and he's telling Tom, he's telling Tom that well, when y'all get there. When you guys get there, I'll have my men um, release him to you. And so Tom, I'm like, okay, what? I mean, because I'm not the attorney. Tom, I'm like, okay, what's he going to say? So Tom says, you're the AW, and the AW says, yes, I'm the AW. So okay, you've read the court order. He said yes, I've read the court order. The court order says immediate release. Okay, so what you do is you tell your men to take those the chains off him right now. And you tell your men to walk. I said, well, hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when we get to the hospital, when we get to the hospital in Pekin, Illinois, John is literally in the bed, okay, with no chains on him. Of course, when I was at Leavenworth, again, Mr. Abusive here, okay, um, I was like young, okay, and these the Italians that were at Leavenworth with Eddie, John Mandacine, and the rest of those, those people, I, th I didn't get to sit at their table. OK, so I know. But anyway, so John was very happy to see me when we arrived at the hospital. And he said, man, Russ, they just took the chains off me and, and, and left. I said, yeah, they took yeah. the chains off you and they just left. Mm -hmm. OK, 
it's the best, the best, uh, <laughs> best news you could ever hear if you're if you're someone uh, that's been locked up for that long. Yep. Well, as we close this uh, up, uh, Eddie, I guess just I have two more questions, and then I want to just give everybody a, a opportunity to let everyone know where they can uh, contact you guys. First, Eddie, um, what's your? And again, you don't have to answer this if you don't want, but people today want to pretend like the Kansas City Mafia is gone. It's definitely not what it was. It's not what the Sevilla uh, brothers had created. It's not even what uh, Willie Camisano led. But would you say that I am accurate when I tell people that there is some organization left, that there are still people in that world that do that stuff in Kansas City, uh, that it hasn't just completely disappeared? I'm not aware of it. I, I have no contact, so I really don't know. Okay, that's all you needed to say. Uh, and then um, final question that to, to Eddie would be, how do you want people to remember you? Um, you know, whether it be in Kansas City or, or uh, the rest of the country. I mean, you're somebody that has lived a pretty notorious life. You've done bad things. You've done good things. I think that's kind of a representation of humanity. We're all complex human beings. Nobody is one dimensional. How do you how do you sum up your your time on this earth, Eddie? I want to continue to do good. I want to continue to try to help people. I'm old now, you know. I don't know how long I might not be here tomorrow, you know. But as long as I'm here, I'd like to help people. Do you think people on the street uh, will be, you know, in Kansas City? Does it matter to you what people think of you? Um, you know, in that in that uh, former environment that you used to live in or or do you not really care if people think of you uh in, in really care. high esteem or not i don't really care this is this is a this is a true uh living legend uh eddie cox thank you so much for joining us and giving us an opportunity to talk to you thank you rusty and tom for for complimenting uh eddie's story and, and helping us set this up um rusty uh, Tom, let everyone know where, where, where people can contact you guys. Okay. Um, they can contact us here in Springfield or they can contact us in Kansas City. Um, we're at Tom Nord Law. Um, when you get me and Eddie and Tom on the case, me and Eddie have won over 100 post-conviction motions. Eddie Cox and I have been to the Supreme Court twice, won one, lost one. That was Tommy Rutledge back in maybe 98. 95, yeah. Um, we, we win cases. Um, I, we act like every case is a death penalty case. Okay. Every case, I don't care for it. Even him, me and the, the other paralegals that work here at Tom Nord, we argue. I tell, it doesn't matter if it's a traffic ticket. You think of it as a death penalty case because people sell their cars. They sell their houses to come in here and give their hard earned money to us to do a job. Um, it, okay. It's important. It's very important work. Tom, kind of give us a closing, I guess, about your, you know, the work that you do, how people can can uh, find you and, and retain you, but also maybe just give us, if you can, if, you, if you're willing to, just uh, some thoughts on Eddie and, and Eddie's legacy and what he's meant to you. Well, and I'll tell you, some of the best times I've had with Eddie, he probably doesn't even know it, but it's just riding the car. You know what I mean? And, and you'll hear a story that, that blows your mind. You know, you're like, I'm, I'm sitting in the car with a guy that's, that's lived that life. But you heard what he just said. I mean, he wants to be known as somebody who's done good. And I'm going to tell you that the 180 degree turnaround from where he's been to what he's doing now, it, it's unbelievable. When you sit and think about Rusty and Eddie and John Mandacina and all these guys at one point in time in their life are all probably sitting around a table thinking they're never going to see the light of day. I know Eddie says he, he always thought he'd get out someday, but as they sat there, they were life without parole. It's an amazing story to be able to work and get just the knowledge that I get from, from Eddie and, and from working with Rusty. You know, it, it's phenomenal. And I, I'm so proud of the work we've done. I'm proud of what we're going to do. Um, you know, you can reach us at nordlaw.com or, you know, any way you want to get a hold of us, you can. 
um, these guys have a pretty good pipeline. They, they have people that are always looking for them and, and, and we're easy to find if you want to find us. But like Rusty said, we work our butts off man, and, and, and we take this very seriously. When, when you've learned law in prison and if you screw up, you may get a hole punched in you. You practice law different than guys like us that get to law school and just go out there and do it. So there is a different type of urgency. There's a different type of dedication that goes in to that practice. And I'm proud of that. And, uh, you know, we're going to continue to do what we do as long as we can and uh, hopefully help a lot more people in the future. Well, you guys have done it. You've said it all. Eddie, I, I say this just you've lived a movie script. You've lived 10 movie scripts. Um, there's a lot of people out there that are trying. And, and this is, again, neither this is neither here nor there. There's a lot of people out there that, claim they've got a million dollar story 99.9 percent of them don't it's just the same story told a million different times in different cities and eddie you legitimately have a million dollar story i hope somebody comes in and and wants to uh, tell your story at a at a at a higher level at a bigger level where more people can see it i hope i can start this uh train rolling and let everyone know uh the true story of of eddie cox and how uh what a change man you are and how you you've taken a lot of negative and turned it into a lot of positive, not just for yourself, but for uh, you know, dozens, hundreds of, of, of people. Rusty, go ahead. The person that's really okay. I listen. I love Eddie. I love Eddie. Okay. Like a, like a, like a father. Okay. But we, we move forward and the person we're after is Steve Wright. His name is Moody. Okay. This man, it, it's he got he had three homicides. They reduced him to fifteen, and he's hung up with a life sentence for the crack cocaine, which is now because of the disparity been reduced. And he is still over there at USP Atwater. Okay, if anybody wants to help us, what we need is we need support for the next guy. Okay, me and Eddie are out. We need we need support for the next guy. The next guy on the next guy that that that's on our agenda is Steve Wright. Moody, 51st Street Crip from Kansas City, Missouri, okay, that, that's been in there for over 24 years. Um, you reduce the homicides to 15 years and you've got him hooked up on the crack cocaine after we after you've reduced the disparity, but he's still there. Okay. This man has a family also. This man also has a story. So although I love Eddie and I love his story, I love my story, I love Tom Nord. We're trying to help the next guy. Yep, there are more Thank stories God. to be told and more uh, happy endings to be had. Thank you, uh, Tom and Rusty and Eddie for for joining us and telling us your story and and doing the good work that you guys do. Thanks for joining us. I hope you guys enjoy this as much as I have because this has been, like I said, it was one of the most anticipated uh, episodes I've done. That it's been in the works for a couple years and it's it's turned out better than I expected. And uh, thank you guys so much. Thanks. Thank you, man. Thank you, you guys have a great weekend. OG Pod, I'll see you guys for another long form interview very soon. Scott Bernstein, OG Pod, we're out. Mm -hmm.